Hi, my name is John Cullen. I'm one of the pastors here at Southbridge. Thank you so much for checking out our sermons online. Our prayer is that you're challenged by the Word of God and grow in your affections for Christ. We recognize that this can be a great supplement to your personal study, or maybe you simply could not make it to church this week. Our hope, though, is that you're plugged into a local community of faith. So if you live in the Raleigh-Durham area and looking for a church, we would love to meet you on a Sunday and help you get connected. If you are not local, we want to encourage you to find a gospel-centered church in your area. Thank you again for letting us be a part of your week. Enjoy the Word of God proclaimed. Good morning, church family. You got your Bible, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 today. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We've been going through this series in the book of 2 Corinthians talking about the sufficiency of God's grace. As you're turning in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, let me just ask you this question. Have you ever been overwhelmed? Some of you are laughing. That wasn't a joke. That was just a question. Ever had those moments where you just feel like it's too much? One of the people out in the um, front before I was walking in here today just said, All right, which kid are you going to pick on today? <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't really have a plan, but let me tell you this story since I'm up here. Um, <laughs> my kids just looked at me like, what's he going to say? Last Friday, I was, uh, it was a busy day. The night before, we had had a pastor's retreat. We were praying through just direction and what the Lord's doing next in our church. And so at about 10 o'clock in the morning, I left there, ran some errands. Uh, was at a funeral for a woman in our church who died. Some of you may have known Sylvia Dumas, kind of a, a lobby ninja. She was out there always. If you were new to our church, she was going to say hi to you. She was going to meet you, and she went to be with Jesus. And Sylvia had been in a part of our church since we had about like 40 people at the very beginning. And uh, was with her family. It was an emotional time, and was done with that at about 2 o'clock. And knew that I had to run up to my daughter's soccer practice. I was in downtown Raleigh. Her soccer practice is in Wake Forest, for those of you who are familiar with this area. And I was about 20 minutes from practice. She had to be there in about 15 minutes. And she called and said, I don't have anything. Like, I don't have my cleats. I don't have my jersey. I don't have my short. I don't have a ball. And I knew that I was 20 minutes from our house, which is where she left all those things. She had to be to practice in 15 minutes. My house is another 20 minutes. So I'm 40 minutes from getting to her. And I'm already, like, the day's been busy. I don't have any margin for any problems. And so I just made this noise. Ah! Have you ever, ever had that one? Yeah? Some heads nodding out there? That's overwhelmed. And I was thinking about it as a study in the passage this week, how overwhelming this year has been. And so I jotted down a few of the things that have happened this year. And I think that as I share them, some of you will be like, wow, that happened this year? Listen, 47 million acres of property was burned in Australia. Displaced thousands of people, 34 people died. You remember that? Too much other stuff has happened probably. Prince Harry... Meghan Markle decided they're no longer going to be royal. Tough decision. Most of us don't have to think about that. The Duke and Duchess. Donald Trump was impeached. Less than 30 days later, he was acquitted. The United Kingdom left the European Union. Did you even know that? The U.S. killed an Iranian general named Soleimani. When that happened, Iran vowed that they were going to make us pay. There was a tension in America at that point of like, are we going to significant, like we're going into like another world war here? What's happening? Many of us have forgotten that that even happened. There was a cruise ship. Do you remember this cruise ship? The Diamond Princess cruise ship. Wild story happened on it at the beginning of the year because we were like, what? Those, all those people had to quarantine on that boat? And then the rest of the world had to as well. 3,711 passengers and crew had to quarantine because there was a guy who, after he got off the first leg of the ship, tested positive for a disease called the coronavirus. Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gigi died. Oh, by the way, these all happened in January. Here's some other things that have happened throughout the year. I won't read you everything that's happened because it would be overwhelming. In March, for some reason, no one could find toilet paper. <laughs> on March 9th, the Dow plummet, the greatest single-day drop ever. I went shortly afterwards on a trip with our church, a tour trip to Israel, and I was talking to a gentleman who was retired in our church, and he said, my 401K has become a 101K. March Madness was canceled. The NBA, NHL, other major sports canceled. You know it's a big deal when that happens. We ended up a global pandemic. It wasn't just China and Italy. Murder hornets happened. Nobody's got time for that. There's a massive explosion in Beirut. Killed 190 people. Normally that would stop everything. We'd, what happened? Wildfires erupted in California. The Summer Olympics were canceled. That was supposed to happen this year. All right, we can adapt. Zoom calls, right? Zoom small group and Zoom dates and Zoom gatherings and Zoom meetings and everybody gets Zoomed out. We start coining new phrases. Oh, we ran out of coins too. But we start coining new phrases. 
Crisis fatigue, social distancing, furloughing means we like you, but we're not going to pay you anymore. We begin to debate about the cost of all these things. Is it too much? Is the cure to what's going on actually too much? Abuse is going up with kids, and you've got problems with mental illness on an all-time high, suicide rates high. So all that's happening. There's racial tension in the world. There's some protests that happen, peaceful protests in some cities. We see other cities that are on fire, not peaceful protests. People start watching the news like it's a religious devotion and get overwhelmed not only with the content, but just the, the amount of information there is. And soon we start to wonder, the same nation that wondered if we were going to go to war at, with Iran is now wondering, are we going to start fighting each other? There's global news. Puerto Rico has multiple earthquakes. There's locusts swarming Africa. Yes, this is not just in the Bible. This is happening. Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. There was an election. It's still happening. I don't know if you noticed. That's all kind of overwhelming, isn't it? That's not everything. Kind of a high view of things that have happened this year. It's overwhelming. What if, what if I told you it's possible to have joy? Because when most of us think of the sound, ah, that's not a joyous sound. What if I told you that you could have not only joy but overflowing joy in an overwhelming world? Because that's what our passage of Scripture talks about today. If you've got your Bibles and you haven't turned there yet, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We've been going through the book of 2 Corinthians together for a while. You've heard me say this is the most personal book that the Apostle Paul writes in the New Testament. He writes 13 books in the New Testament. He shares the most about his own personal life in this book. And, and, and here we've been walking through it. Now, to be honest with you, I thought when we started this series that we were going to be able to study the whole book of 2 Corinthians before Christmas. Well, Christmas is coming in a couple weeks. Any amens for that, by the way? And some of you, after hearing those headlines, are like, we made it! It's like, it. I've seen some of you, by the way, who've been like decorating your house already, and then other people judge you. How many of you here listen to Christmas music already? Anybody put up any decorations? Yeah, it's fine. You can do it, by the way. It's 2020. Like, who cares? You don't even need rationalization. I've seen some people put memes out that say, Joseph didn't even know Mary was pregnant yet. And you're like, Sorry, Joseph. We're 2020. We're playing music. Elizabeth knew. You can tell people that if they give you that information, by the way. And so we've been going through this series. I thought we'd get to that. We're going to pause, and we're going to take a break. And so on November 29th, in a couple weeks, that's the week that we go to two services for in-person as well. And if you, if you want to help make it possible for more people to come to church, we could use your help in Bridge Kids. By the way, Bridge Kids is a great ministry because it's like a double blessing because you get to invest in the life of a young kid, maybe lead them to Jesus, but then also provide the opportunity for their parents to even come to church. And so we've been doing tickets here, and they've sold out every week um, on different classes. And so if you're interested in serving in Bridge Kids, go to the Next Steps uh, table that's out in the, the lobby today, and uh, we'd love to get you signed up for that. But on November 29th, we're going to start a new Christmas series called Hope Delivered. So we're going to take a break from 2 Corinthians. I promise we'll come back in 2021. For those of you who are like, you can't stop it. We didn't finish. How does this thing end? You're allowed to read on your own, first of all. But then we'll come back to it in 2021 and wrap up 2 Corinthians. But here, Paul's talking about 2 Corinthians chapter 7, how to have overflowing joy in an overwhelming world. Look what he says in verse 1. Verse 1 really wraps up last week in chapter 6. It's an unfortunate chapter break here. Those aren't inspired by, the, by God either. It just helps us find stuff in the Bible. But it says, since we have these promises. He's referring back to the promises from last week when Paul was, his heart, he was going, I hope you didn't receive the grace of God in vain. It wasn't empty. It wasn't meaningless. Maybe you prayed a prayer, but there's no impact. Your life was never changed. Or you walked an aisle or raised your hand, but there's no change in your life because what he was seeing in the Corinthians was discouraging. And he invested his life in them for 18 months. And he's going, but now you're acting like this? And he just told him about some promises, promises of God's fellowship, promises of God's presence. And he says, because of those promises, look at verse 1, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion, the fear of God. And so because of God's promises, we can live holy lives. And then he starts a, a new topic in verse 2. He says, make room in your hearts. He's talking about their relationship with each other. Make room in your hearts for us. Implied in that is that they hadn't yet. He said, we've wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We've taken advantage of no one. And remember what's happening in 2 Corinthians. There's some teachers that came in after Paul left, and they were trying to say this bad stuff about him, about his team, about their ministry. And he's been writing this book, making all these arguments. And so he's really summarizing the book there in verse 2. And then verse 3 says, I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I'm acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. That's key. In fact, if you go through this whole chapter, verses 1 through 16, and you might even do it while I'm talking, 
and just underline every time you see the word comfort or comforted, and every time you see the word joy or rejoice, and what you'll see is this whole chapter is about comfort and joy. Seven times you'll find the word comfort. If you find more, please let me know. Enjoy or rejoice, five different times you'll see it. That's what it's talking about. So here he says, I am filled with comfort in all our affliction. I'm overflowing with joy. What? In all our affliction, I'm overflowing with joy. So how's that possible for him? Implied for us, we've got to ask ourselves the question. Is Paul's affliction easier than my affliction? Maybe he can experience overflowing joy in all his affliction because his affliction isn't like my affliction. Now, everybody's pain is unique. We shouldn't judge each other's pain because it's going to be unique to the person who's experiencing that in that moment. But when you look at what Paul's gone through, just in the book so far that we've read, there's a famous chapter, it's probably the most famous chapter in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11. He talks about being beaten and in danger and stoned and beaten with rods and flogged and all kinds of terrible stuff. But just what we've seen so far, do you remember chapter 1 and verse 8? Paul said, I despaired, I've experienced so much affliction, I despaired, I don't want you to be unaware. I despaired of life itself. That's pretty heavy affliction. In chapter 4, in chapter 4, he says, uh, in verses 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Last week's passage, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings. I don't think many of us here are being beaten because of our faith in Jesus. Imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger. And then if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it reads like headlines from 2020. That was Paul's life all the time. And here he said, did you see in verse 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4? I am filled with comfort and all our affliction, overflowing with joy. The question is how? Okay, great for you, Paul. How is that possible? And here I want to teach you something, not just a message today, but how to study the Bible on your own. When you you come to a verse like verse 4, You've got to ask yourself, how? How does this happen? How can this be true? And then so what you have to do is read what's going on. You can't stop at verse 4. You've got to read verse 5, but you can't just stop at verse 5. You've got to read verse 6. Look at verses 5 and 6. For, all right, if I'm teaching you how to study the Bible, circle that word. The word for is important when you see it in the Bible. Words like for, because, sometimes the two words together, so that, they tell you the reason. And so he's just made this bold statement. Here's the reason. I'm overflowing with joy for, but then he gives more explanation. Even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. They weren't sleeping, but we were afflicted at every turn. More affliction, fighting without, fear within. Then here's the reason. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us. How did he do it? By, you can underline that word too. Here's the means, the coming of Titus. And so what we see here is that the comfort that he's experiencing comes from, ultimately, the character of God. It's in verse 6, but God. And here's our main point for today's sermon. It's simply this, that the God of the Bible, I don't know about your God because you might not worship the God of the Bible, but the God of the Bible is a God of comfort who comforts us in chaos. God is a God of comfort who comforts us in the midst of chaos. And the key to understanding this passage of Scripture is not just counting the amount of times comfort's in there. It's definitely about comfort. It's not just counting the amount of times joy's in there. But here's the thing you need to take away from that, is if you're going to experience the overflowing joy, it comes from the comfort of God. And that God's the one who comforts us, and the key is those two words at verse 6, but God. Those are key words in the Bible. I don't know if anyone's ever written a book called But God. If not, that might be your first book. Why don't you go through the Bible and study all the but God moments in the book? Because they're significant. Have you ever had a but God moment? Our world could use a but God moment right now. If you read through the Bible, you see verses like in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 50, there's this guy named Joseph. He's been lied about. He's been abused. He's the first person in the Bible that we see this human, human trafficking takes place. He was sold into slavery. He stands before his accusers. He stands before his abusers. He stands before those who lied about him. He stands before these people who've caused the most harm in his family and their family members. Some of you can relate. And he says, you intended to harm me, but God. 
You read in David's life, David's being pursued by Saul. Saul's the king. Saul wants to kill him. David's been anointed king. It's like Saul senses this and all of his insecurity, and he's trying to run him down. Saul's got all the resources. Saul's got all the people. Saul should be able to find him. He's pursuing him. For Samuel chapter 23, but God. But God didn't let him find him. You read the Psalms, and in Psalm 73, it says this, the psalmist is crying out, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And in the book of Acts, I love this one, Peter's preaching, Peter's denied Jesus, he's been restored, and now he's going to be the guy that God uses. Is that not ironic? The guy that God uses to start a movement, a people of second chances called the church. And he says to the people that are there that day on the day of Pentecost, God sent his son Jesus. He's the Lord. You killed him. But God raised him from the dead. My favorite but God in the whole Bible is in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says that, that we are children of wrath. It says that we were separated from God because of our sin, that we're children of wrath, that we're dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive in Christ Jesus. Somebody here had a but God moment? If not, you're not a Christian. Because there's a way that seems right to each one of us. We're headed towards destruction, but God intervened and took us from being children of wrath to becoming children of God. It's a but God moment. You ever been in a bout with doubt? Like you're just one, like is this true? Is this stuff real? But God reveals himself to you, reaffirms your faith. Or you're in these overwhelming moments like this passage of Scripture talks about, like, like Paul was talking about here for himself. He said, there were fights without, the things that were going on outside of me, there were battles between people that I love, there were people saying stuff about me, there was fear within, there was stuff happening inside of me, but God, then he says, comforts the downcast. He's one of the downcast. That's another word that can be used for depression. The humbled ones. And we see people get depressed all throughout the heroes of our faith being depressed. And he's saying, but God in his character of who he is comes and comforts those people. God is a God of comfort. But how? How does he do it? Well, he does it, first of all, just through who he is, his character. It's because of who he is he shows up. And you know what? Our world needs right now a but God moment. If it's going to happen, do you know what's going to happen? Through you. How do I know that? I know that because the Bible tells us that you are God's plan for reaching this world for Jesus. The church, it's plan A. There is no plan B. But here's the problem. Many of us, our emotions, our lives are dictated just like the rest of the world's are by our circumstances. And so that our emotions are, so I talk to you about joy and over, overflowing joy and overwhelming world. You're like, that's not even possible. What's this speech going to be about? No, the God tells us right here, as you're a follower of Jesus, you can experience that. But what needs to happen is you're not controlled by the circumstances without, but by the God within. And so you've got, to, you've got to be controlled by this God who is a God of comfort, not by the circumstances around you. Doesn't mean you don't notice them. Doesn't mean you're aloof to them. Paul says, I was downcast. There's fighting without, there's fear within, but God. So how does that comfort happen? Well, that's what the rest of this passage unpacks for us. So the main point is that our God is a God of comfort in the midst of chaos. How does he do it? One of the ways is this way, through his promises. God comforts us through his promises. If you go to verse 1, he tells us that we can live holy lives because of his promises. There's an implied promise. Grammatically, it's not phrased as a promise in verse 6, but it's implied here, who comforts the downcast. And so it's implied that he will comfort the downcast. That'd be the grammatical way to say it. He will com- God, because if he is a God of comfort in his character, will comfort you. It's a promise. And he comforts you with his promises. There are hundreds of them. We don't have time to pick all of them. I was listening to a woman share a story this week, just a testimony of what God had done in her life, and I had never heard of her before. I have no idea how I've been a Christian this long and hadn't heard of this woman. I don't know if you've heard of her. Darlene Diebler, she's a missionary. Most of you are looking at me like, you never heard of her either? Let me tell you a little bit of her story then. Uh, Darlene Diebler felt called into mission when she was 10 years old, 10-year-old little girl. She had gone to a church meeting, really, that she wasn't even invited to. Uh, it was for high school students and college students. But as a 10-year-old little girl, brown hair, big eyes, she said, I just found a seat in the back of the room, and the pastor's up there preaching, and you need to go, go share the gospel, share the gospel wherever God calls you. And she said, I felt a hand on my shoulder sitting in the back row. So I turned around, and I started to look. There was nobody there. But I sensed God say to my heart, my child, will you go wherever? 
no matter the cost? And she said in that moment, she said, God, I will go wherever you want me to go, regardless of the cost. And she felt overwhelmed that God would even see her. God sees you. And he called her. She gets married when she's 19 years old to a guy named Russell Diebler. And Russell Diebler was about 12 years older than her at that time. And he was a pioneer missionary. That means that he was the first person to go and share the gospel in a place. It was in Papua New Guinea. No one had really gone into, no one from our, our part of the world had gone into this western side of the island. They had just discovered this people group about a year before. He went because of just process there and all that. She wasn't able to go for it until a year later. She said, when she showed up there, she said, I felt like I was at home. These are my people. She loved them, wanted to share the gospel with them, knew this is where she was supposed to be. This was during World War II, though. And World War II had taken over that part of the world as they were shortly into their ministry. And that meant that they went under house arrest to start, which then led to labor camps. While they were in their labor camps, they separated the men from the women. So she's newly married to this guy, and they get separated from one another. So the day that they came to separate them, that she went into her, her house to grab clothes for him, and she's pulling stuff and put in a suitcase, told she couldn't have a, uh, uh, or not a suitcase, into a pillowcase, said she couldn't have a suitcase, so she runs back out there. He's already in the truck. The truck is driving away. She didn't even get to say goodbye to him. She gives the clothes into the truck, and he just says, our Lord promised he will never leave you or forsake you. But then, and I can't tell you her whole story, but she tells about moments where it felt like God had left. She's a prisoner of war for four years. The first part in a labor camp. In the labor camp, she has to do all clear streets. She's one of the young people, even though she's a lady that's there, not super big uh, person or anything like that. She's got to clear trees and make roads and uh, sew uniforms for the Japanese soldiers that have them imprisoned and uh, do all kinds of stuff. They put big bags of salt and sugar on her back. She had to run them from a truck up into a barn like she was a mule, and she would do it, and she said, I just I can't do one more. And she didn't want to get beaten, so she'd do more. And, and one day, she's working out in the field, and she gets called back in. This woman sits down with her and she says, you know that your husband's been sick for a while. And then she said, I looked at the woman's eyes and she started to cry. And I said, don't tell me he's gone. And the woman looked at her and said, your husband died three months ago. And she said it was one of those moments where she felt like she had been forsaken. So I just closed my eyes. I hear bombs going off in the background. But I saw my Lord looking down from heaven. He sees me, still sees me. Not long after that, she was accused of being a spy. She didn't know Morse code or anything like that, but the, somebody had said that she was out in the woods with a radio speaking to the enemy. And so they took her to a prison camp. They took her from the labor camp to a prison camp. The prison camp was maximum security. She was put in a cell all by herself because she knows multiple languages. She knew the words that were on the cell door as she went in and the words on the door above her cell, this person must die. So she knew she was on death row. She got beaten continually while she was there, trying to get her to confess to being a spy, but she really wasn't. They'd hit her on the back of the neck. They'd hit her on the bridge of her nose continually, but she never cried in front of her captors. She said, when I went back to my cell, I would weep like a baby. And I'd say, God, I can't do, I cannot take one more beating. I said, and God said to me, my grace is, not will be, not was, is sufficient for you. Those are promises. She talked about what it was like in that cell. She had to eat rats, had to eat tadpoles, had to eat all this nasty stuff. They brought her this rice porridge one time, and she got the rice porridge, and she was excited about it because she thought on the top of it, she thought, somebody here knows that I love shaved coconut. And she was excited because it looked like it had shaved coconut on it. She didn't have much light in this cell. There was a transom above the doors, and so she held the porridge up to that, and she realized there were worms crawling around on top of it. She pushed them off to the side of the plate so she could eat the rice porridge. Eventually, a flies came in and started eating these worms, and she realized the flies can eat them, then I can eat them, and so she ate all of it. One day, she was climbing up on the transom. This is my favorite story that she shared. And she was looking out the window, and she could see outside of the, where the prison was at, and there was a woman that had a bushel of bananas. And she said, I wanted the bananas so bad I could feel it. And so I got down on my knees, and I said, my Lord, will you just give me one banana? I don't want a whole bushel of bananas like that woman. Could you just give me one banana? And I don't know if you ever do this, but she started to try and figure out in her mind, how could God actually make that happen? And she started thinking, that guard's not going to bring it. He's the one who beats her. That guard's not going to do it. He'd get killed. This is, and there aren't that many people there. And she finally realized there's no way for God, I'm sorry for asking for this if it's too hard for you to get it in here. <laughs> As she's praying, the door opens and the guard comes in, but it wasn't one of the guards that was beating her. It was the guy from the labor camp that was in charge of the labor camp. 
And well, he was not a great guy. He wasn't beating her. And she started to cry because she saw a familiar face and she was excited to see him. She went over to him and she said to him, I need to tell you about a man that I met when I was nine year old, nine year old in Iowa. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the creator of the world. And he can save you from your sins. He's why I don't hate you. Because he loves you. And she laid out the plan of salvation, how it's possible for anyone, anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. She says, as I shared this news with him, he just nodded and wept. And then they brought him in. Do you know what they were? Bananas. 92 of them laid out on the floor. No idea why or how they got there. But then she said, my Lord can do beyond what I could ever ask or imagine. What sustained her? Promises. You overwhelmed? What promises are you clinging to? Your God is a God of comfort. He comforts us through His promises. And not only through His promises, but did you see right in this passage, I told you to underline the word by, through His people. He comforts us through not just His promises, but He comforts us through His people, through God's people. Let me read you that verse again. In verse 5, it said, But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by, here's the means, the coming of Titus. And not only by His coming, but also by, here's the means, the comfort with which he was comforted by you. Talking about the Corinthians, these people he's invested his life in for 18 months. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice. There's that joy again, still the more. So it's the comfort that brought the joy. It's the comfort of God. And how did he bring the comfort of God to the people of God? You know what I love about this? It's not miraculous. It's not a voice from heaven. God does that. It's not an angel like visited Mary. God does that. It's not like on Acts chapter 9 when he, he was on the Damascus road and God stops him. God does that. He can do that. But that's not daily. You know what's more daily? Mundane things. Mundane things like people. And God brings people to be his comfort in this situation. But sometimes we've got a problem in how we, we view our relationship with God as Christians. Do you, ever hear, do you ever hear newly married couples say this? All I need is love. Some of you said that before. Some of you are smiling. You don't want to acknowledge it. I get it. I understand. I do premarital counseling, and so I talk with people that have the same kind of answers. They think they're the first ones to have the answers every time, but what are you guys going to do? Oh, we just, we just love each other. God's going to figure it all out. Like, well, you need a job. It's like, what I want. It's like you just got to be a dad in a couple moments there. It's like, well, where are you going to live? Like, we just lay love, love. God's going to work it all out. And it's like anybody who's been married for like 10 minutes I was like, that's just dumb. Like, not that you don't want to love each other, not against love, but there's some practical things that need to happen, right? Well, here's the problem. Sometimes as Christians, here's what we do. All I need is God. We even sing songs like that. Here's the problem. It's not true. Do you need food? The farmers need rain? Like, we need, we don't just need God. Oh, well, there's a pastor. You're not supposed to say that. Listen, I'm not saying anything bad about God. God, all he needs is God. God is self-sufficient. God's omniscient, God's omnipotent, God's all those things. He doesn't need us. We do need Him, but we need more than just God. God alone is not enough. It's not good for us to be alone. Remember the Bible in Genesis chapter 1? God creates, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. There's one thing that's not good. You know what's not good? For Adam to be alone. But wait a minute. He's in perfect relationship with God. Sin hasn't even come into the equation yet. But it's not good for Him to be alone? No, because He created you not only to need him, but to need his gifts. I read an article this week by a guy named Scott Hubbard. Let me read you a quote from it. He gives illustrations of multiple people throughout the Bible to, to teach this truth. He says, throughout Scripture, God's people often need more than God alone. They need God through the things he has made. They need not only the grace of God in the gospel, but also the gifts of God in creation. He goes on to talk about Adam, to talk about Elijah. He needed food. Talk about Paul. Paul right here in this passage. He needed, in order to receive the comfort of God, he needed Titus. You know who Titus was to him? It wasn't just a friend. See, sometimes I think we do a disservice in churches and people will come and be like, I'm not that connected. You need to get in a small group. And we're implicitly communicating, you just need some friends. Well, a lot of you have friends. But who are you investing your life in? See, here's what Titus was to Paul. Titus, he calls in another place in the Bible, his son in the faith. This is an intimate relationship with somebody he's pouring his life into. You know why he's so distraught by how the Corinthians are doing? Because he's poured his life into these people. 
This is, a, this is beyond just we're friends, we know each other, we're all Christians. Here's the deal. What Paul could have done, he could have canceled the Corinthians. Unfollow, I'll show you. I'm never going to that church in Corinth again. Like, that's what we do, you know, for multiple reasons. One is we don't like conflict. Nobody here likes conflict. God oftentimes uses conflict in our lives to change our hearts. He's, there's conflict between Paul and the Corinthians here, and he's confronted them. He writes them a letter. I'll read those verses in just a second that we don't have, confronting their sin. But the reason why his heart is so distraught is because he cares about these people, because he's invested in their lives. Did you know it's impossible to be an obedient Christian and not do that? Let me go really slow right here, because God may reveal some sin in some of our hearts that we didn't even know was a sin. Do you know it's impossible to be an obedient Christian, I'm not saying you can't be a Christian, but it's impossible to be an obedient Christian and not have deep, intimate, biblical community. Because there's 59 commandments in the Bible that require not only another person, but an intimate relationship with those other people. They're the one another's of the Bible. And you can take some of them and be like, love one another. Yeah, I feel nice about you and be kind to one another. I'm not mean to you and be encourage one another. I'll write you a note. But you get into some of them, confess your sins one to another. <laughs> do I trust you? Do I trust you're not going to go tell everybody else? That requires some intimacy. Carry each other's burdens? Do we even know each other's burdens? See, in order to be an obedient Christian, you have to have other people, and that's those other people that God uses them to deliver His comfort in your life. That's who these people were to Paul in this passage of Scripture when he talks about Titus and he talks about the Corinthians. You can go back and read verses, verses 5 and 6, and you go through there and you see what's happening here. It was by these people that he is invested in because of their relationship. One of the best compliments our family has ever been given was by a nine-year-old girl in our church. Her name's uh, Rachel, Ray Ray, we call her, but Rachel Henserling. And she said about our family, those leers, they're shower-uppers. I was like, what does that mean? And uh, they had had their, the Henserling family. Some of you know JD's an uh, elder in our church and, and Denise. Um, they had had multiple difficult things. They had gone through a season of difficulty. It was emotional and different circumstances in their life. Then they had several tragedies happen. One was that Ray Ray had broken her arm. And at that moment, my, my daughter Janie and my wife uh, showed up at the hospital when she was getting her cast. And then it wasn't that much longer. Their house actually caught on fire, burned down. And so we showed, most of our family showed up at that point, standing in the neighbor's yard across the street, watching their house get doused with water by the fire department. We're talking. Ray Ray's out there with her rubber boots on because you don't really get dressed up for your house catching on fire. And we're talking, got miraculously allowed their boys to get out of that house. And then later, the, JD had told me that. He said, you know what Ray Ray says about the Lears? They're shower uppers. But do you know why it mattered that we showed up? I'm not just a dude that like speaks to them. I'm not just like, hey, that's the guy from the stage and he came to our tragedy. No. And JD had been our small group leader for about four years, investing in me and in my family. And through that, because of that relationship, we challenged each other. We confessed sins to each other. We confronted other people's sins and pursued them in their sin because we know that God uses that conflict sometimes for their good and sometimes for ours. It's never fun. We've humbled ourselves with our own sins in front of each other, carried each other's burdens and prayed together. And because we were important to each other, when we showed up, it mattered. Who do you show up for? And it matters. It's the people you invest in. Who are you investing in? See, God's going to comfort you, but your disobedience might be blocking some of the ability for that to even happen if you don't even have those relationships. God comforts us through His promises. He comforts us through His people. And there's another way in this passage through godly grief. God comforts us through godly grief. What is that? Most of us here have experienced some level of grief this year. Whether it's a loss of a person, I mentioned Sylvia in our church already. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you, because of the season that we're in, weren't even able to have a funeral because of what was going on with our global shutdown. Some of you, weddings have changed, plans have changed, graduation things have not been what you thought they were going to be, seniors, college has not started the way you thought, like all kinds. There's a lot to grief. But we're talking about a different kind of grief here. Look at what Paul says. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, that's the letter we don't have that I told you he's confronting their sin, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, like he was torn about it, like it felt bad, that it made you feel bad, but look what he says. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. His point wasn't to cause them pain. His point was the outcome that he hoped for, and here it is. As it is, I rejoice, 
not only because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffer no loss through us. For godly grief, here's what it is, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For, see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, and here's the fruit of your repentance, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you've been proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So, Although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, which is probably a third party they were believing that was saying stuff about Paul, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, probably Paul, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. And here's where we see this godly conflict can produce transformation in our lives, in churches. Like, do you know that's why we have deacons, by the way? Not just this church. I mean, that's why deacons exist in the Bible. Acts chapter 6, there was conflict that happened. The Greeks were saying to the Hebrews, hey, you're not taking care of our widows, you're taking care of your widows. What's the deal here? There was racial tension in the church. Out of that grew deacons. Who's thankful for deacons? They're our shower-uppers, by the way. They show up all the time. We got deacons in our church. I'm so thankful for you and the ministry you have in so many people's lives. That came out of conflict because there was a problem. See, we run from conflict, and we cancel, and we unfollow, and we do all those things, and we're missing out on some of the transformation God wants to do in our lives. That's why I always encourage people, and some of you might even be here today. Maybe it's your first time here, and you come from another church. When I meet people from other churches, I always say, you should go back to that church and tell them why you left. Not because I'm trying to cause fights, but because God does a work in those moments, in the church, and you, and that whole process, and we don't want to miss out on that process. And Paul writes these people, and he confronts them, and, and he was torn about it because no one likes the tension. And he says, I, I didn't want to grieve you, but I'm glad it grieved you because of what it led to, that godly grief, not the worldly grief. And did you see contrast of the two? Godly grief leads to repentance, to bring salvation, that's life. Worldly grief leads to regret, that brings death. You want an example in the Bible? Peter and Judas. They both did the same sin, betrayed Jesus. They both wept. One was worldly grief, one was godly grief. How do you know the difference? Here's the difference. It's the angle of our hearts. What's the angle of our hearts? What are you talking about? It's the angle. It's where our heart is directed. Where is it pointed towards? And the angle of our hearts, it can be horizontal or it can be vertical. Godly grief is vertical. Horizontal grief is, it's like, I wronged you, I wronged you. Let's say, let's say this. Let's say Drew and I are talking after church today. Everybody leaves. We're chatting. You can't see Drew. Drew's a pretty muscular dude. I say, Drew, give me your wallet. And Drew says, no. I go, bah! Pop him in the face. Granted, he'd probably kick my butt, but that's just for the sake of my hypothetical situation. I pop him in the face. I take his wallet. I'm packing up to leave. Later, I go, oh, man, if he tells anybody, I'm going to lose my job. Hey, Drew, here's your wallet back. Here's another five bucks. Don't tell anybody, please. Like, let's just keep this good. I don't want people to stop coming to the church. Reputation management, consequences. I got caught. That's worldly grief. Many of you have probably done that before. I think we've all done it, at least when we were kids. I know my kids have done it. Um, I don't want to deal with the consequences. I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again. We make big promises, like all kinds of things happen. Worldly grief leads to regret. Eventually, death. Read Judas. But, but Peter came, and he, he, he did it, too. He was like, he wept, and he was sorry. But it was between him and God. It's like when David sins with Bathsheba, and then in Psalm 51, he says, against you and you alone have I sinned. That'd be like if I stole your wallet, Drew, and then afterwards I go, what am I doing? God, I'm so sorry. Not, Drew, you still like me, right? Please. Like people pleaser. Everybody else, you don't know about this, right? Reputation management, consequences. I don't know if it's, when it's between me and God, that's a hard angle. That's vertical. How in the world can David, who killed Uriah, who violated, I won't say how because there's kids in here, violated Bathsheba, a baby's dead. Uh, we oftentimes talk about God's forgiveness, but read the rest of the Old Testament. His family was weakened. His kingdom was destroyed because of his sin. There's still consequences. How can he say, because it impacted thousands of people, how can he say, against you and you alone, God, have I sinned? Do you know why? The angle of his heart. He realized first and foremost, what's happened here is a broken relationship with God. And that's what happens in our sin. And that's why repentance is so crucial, even in the life of a follower of Jesus. 
these Corinthians, they're followers of Jesus, but there was a barrier that was broken in their relationship with God, and it was impacting then the horizontal relationships too. They matter. It matters. And yes, it's okay to make amends, but when it's all about that, when your heart angle is there, that's not real repentance. Where repentance starts with God. It's godly grief. You have to experience the godly grief. What has happened here with me and with you? And for many of us, that doesn't even matter. That's a state of our heart, and that's scary. But the vertical relationship, when that godly grief comes, then repentance happens. And repentance removes the barrier of broken relationships. Repentance is when we turn from our sin and we turn back to God. Not turning from our sin and turning back to other people, not turning back for reputation management, not turning back because we got caught, turning back to God, God, against you and you alone have I sinned. Now I'll deal with this other stuff after. But it's, first and foremost, it's me and you. Some of you need to repent today. Some of you need to repent of your lack of relationships with God's people. You didn't even know that was a sin. And take a risk. Take a risk. And, and, and start living like family with some people that aren't your family. But you're bonded together through the mission and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so I said, get in a small group. You're not in a small group. But it takes time. It's not like you're going to get there and all of a sudden we're family. No, it takes time. And it takes experiences. And it takes carrying burdens. And it takes confessing sin. It takes all of that. Some of you need to take a risk and trust Jesus as your Savior. Some of you need to, to cry out to God and go, I didn't, I didn't think you, I thought you had forsaken me. I'm going to cling to your promises. I'm going to be with your people. I'm willing to experience even godly grief. And that is how you have overflowing joy in an overwhelming world. Let me pray. Father, I come before you. Thank you for everyone that's gathered together here today. Thank you for those that are online gathered with us today. I pray that you would move in our hearts right now as we wrap up this sermon. We know you're not done with us. Those of us you've saved, you've promised that you'll be faithful to complete the work you began in us. Will you do another piece of that work right now in our hearts? Some of us in relationships. Some of us to start with our relationship with you. If there's repentance that needs to happen, God, I pray that it would happen in this moment. If you need to cry out to God and confess sin to him, maybe you didn't steal a wallet. Maybe you did. I don't know. But there's something else there, and you know it's there. It's time. Now is the time. Don't let your heart get harder. Some of you might need to trust Jesus as your Savior. You just cry out to him right now. Whether you're in this room, whether you're watching online, you just pray this prayer. God, I acknowledge my sin before you, and I need your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. I want to ask him to be my Savior right now. And if you did that, would you text the word Jesus? The number we'll put up on the screen here. We'll put it on your screen if you're watching live. If you're in this room, would you text the word Jesus to the number that we put up on the screen? Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you that if, you, if all you did was die on the cross for us, that would have been more than enough. But you've provided, sometimes bananas, sometimes in our bank accounts, sometimes with people, just the, even the freedom to be here today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining our sermons online. We hope to see you in person soon. Our location and service times can be found at our website, sfchurch.com. If God has stirred your heart today and you'd like someone to pray with, or if you'd like more information about Jesus, please take a moment and email us at info at sfchurch.com. Thank you again. God bless.